The session is called to order. Everybody is requested to rise for the singing of the national anthem. remain standing for the invocation to be delivered by the Honorable Representative Lorna C. Silverio of the 3rd District of Bulacan. Almighty Father, God of all creation, we come before you today to give honor and praise. You are the source of all that is good. You are the source of all our blessings. Thank you for every gift that has been given. Lord God, we seek your kingdom and intercession that we may accomplish our goals while displaying your character. Give us your guidance this afternoon as we work together as a team to do your will in today's session. By your grace alone, through your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Majority Leader, Mr. Speaker, I move that uh, we call the roll of members. Secretary General is directed to call the roll of, mem of members. Roll call of members, Honorable Representative Abaya, Abayon, Abellanosa, Abu, Abueg, Asharon, Akop, Acosta, Acosta Alba, Adiong, Advincula, Agaraw, Agabao, Aglipay Biliar, Albano, Alcala, Alejano, Almario, Almonte, Alonte, Alvarez Franz, Alvarez Mercedes, Alvarez Pantaleon, Amante, Amatong, Andaya, Angara Castillo, Antonino, Antonio, Aquino Magsaysay, Aragones, Arbison, Arcilias, Arenas, Atienza, Aumentado, Bagao, Bagatsing, Bagilat, Banal, Barbers, Barsaga, Batawil, Batokabe, Bautista Bandigan, Belaro, Belmonte, Luciano, Belmonte Jose Christopher, Belmonte Ricardo, Benitez, Bernos, Bertiz, Biazon, Billones, Biron, Bolilia, Bondok, Bordado, Bravo Anthony, Bravo Maria Vida, 
Rosas, Bulut Bektam, Kagas, Kalalang, Calderon, Calixto Rubiano, Caminero, Campos, Canama, Cari, Casilao, Castelo, Castro Franz, Castro Fred, Catamco, Cayetano, Celeste, Serapica, Ceriles, Chavez, Chipeco, Co, Coanco, Coliantes, Cortés, Fortuna, Cosalan, Crisólogo, Cuba, Cuaresma, Cueva, Dalipe, Datol, Daza, De Jesús, De Venecia, De Vera, Defensor, Del Mar, Del Rosario, De Loso Montalia, De Maporo Abdullah, Di Maporo Muhammad, Duabit, Durano, Di, Elago, Enverga, Erise, Erigel, Ermita Buhain, Escudero, Espina, Espino, Estrella, Eusebio, Ebardone, Fariñas, Fernando, Ferrer Juliet, Ferrer Luis, Periol, Lorendo, Flores, Fortun, Fortuno, Fentebelia, Garbin, García Gwendolyn, García José Enrique, García Albano, Garín Oscar, Garín Sharon, Gazataya, Gachalian, Heron, Go Ana Cristina, Go Mark, Gomez, Gonzaga, Gonzalez Alexandria, Gonzalez Aurelio Dom, Gonzalez Fernando, Goriseta, Gullias, Hernandez, Herrera D, Hopper, Alos Jos, Javier, Co, Conjun, Labad Labad, Lacson, Lagman, Lanete, Laogan, Lazatin, Leachon, Li, Lim Kaishong, La Brigat, Lopez Benhar, Lopez Carlo, Lopez Manuel, Loyola, Mahapagal Arroyo, Maceda, Madrona, Malapitan, Manalo, 
Mangawang, Mangodadato Soharto, Mangodadato Sahid, Marcoleta, Marcos, Marino, Marquez, Martinez, Matugas, Meliana, Mending, Mendoza, Nolasco, Núñez Malañaon, Oaminal, Ocampo, Olivares, Ong Edwin, Ong Henry, Ortega Pablo, Ortega Bininola, Pacquiao, Paduano, Palma, Pancho, Panganiban, Panotes, Papandayan, Pichay, Pimentel, Pineda, Plaza, Primicia Sagabas, Kimbo, Radaza, Ramirez Sato, Ramos, Relámpagos, Revilla, Roa Puno, Robes, Rocamora, Rodríguez Isidro, Rodríguez Máximo, Román, Romero, Romualdez, Romualdo, Roque, Sagdalan, Sagarbaria, Sahali, Salceda, Salimbangon, Salo, Salón, Sambar, Sandoval, San Copan, Santos Recto, Sarmiento Cesar, Sarmiento Edgar Meri, Sabellano, Sema, Chiao, Silverio, Singson, Swansing Estrelita, Swansing Horacio, Suarez, Si Alvarado, Tambunting, Tan Angelina, Tan Milagrosa, Tan Cherny, Tejada, Tebes, Tianco, Ting, Tinio, Tolentino, Treñas, Tugna, Tupas, Ti, Umali, Unabia, Ungab, Unico, Uy Juliet, Uy Rolando, Uy Barreta, Vargas, Vargas Alfonso, Velarde, Velasco, Velasco Catera, Veloso, Vergara, Villafuerte, Villanueva, Villarraza Suárez, Villarica, Villarín, Violago, Yap Arthur, Yap Melesio, Yap Victor, Yu, Zamora Maria Carmen, Zamora Ronaldo, Zarate Subiri.
Mr. Speaker, the roll call shows that 226 members responded to the call. With 226 members responding to the call, the chair declares the presence of a quorum. Majority Leader. Mr. Speaker, considering the copy of journal of the previous session has been distributed to the members, Mr. Speaker, I move that we approve journal number 63 dated February 14, 2018. So move, Mr. Speaker. Is there any objection? The chair hears none. Journal number 63 is here, hereby approved. Majority Leader. Mr. Speaker, I move that we now proceed with the reference of business and request that the Secretary General be directed to read the title of the bills and resolution on first reading, as well as communications and committee reports. So moved, Mr. Speaker. Secretary General is directed to read bills on first reading, as well as communications and committee reports for referral to the appropriate committees. Reference of business, bills on first reading, House Bill 7167, postponing the May 14, 2018 Barangay Sanguni Ang Kabataan Elections, Representative Bumali. To the Committee on Suffrage and Electoral Reforms. House Bill 7168, creating the Metro Railways Transit Regulatory Board. Representative Romero. To the Committee on Government Enterprises and Privatization, the Committee on Transportation, and the Committee on Legislative Franchises. House Bill 7169, prescribing the food guide pyramid labeling for goods, for foods. Representative Co. To the Committee on Health. House Bill 7170, establishing a separate district engineering office in Dabao City, Representative Garcia Albano. To the Committee on Public Works and Highways. House Bill 7171, repealing Republic Act 10912, Representative Stino, Caso, several others. To the Committee on Civil Service and Professional Regulation. Resolution, South Solution 1681, recognizing and commending the Kasamaka Initiative, Representative Rivilla. To the Committee on Poverty Alleviation. House Solution 1682, urging the Committee on Agriculture and Food to investigate the shortage in government subsidized rice. Representative Castello. To the Committee on Rules. House Solution 1683, calling for investigation by the Appropriate Committee on the alleged ultra virus act by the Philippine National Oil Company. Representative Suarez. To the Committee on Rules. House Solution 1684, direct the Committee on Public Order and Security and Local Government to investigate the widespread stoning incidents happening in many parts of the country, Representative Savillano. To the Committee on Rules. House Solution 1685, direct the Committee on Tourism and other appropriate committees to inquire into efforts and activities of the Nai Filipino Foundation, Inc., Representative Pineda, Romero, Belmont, several others. To the Committee on Rules. House Solution 1686, urging the Committee on Agriculture and Food and so Special Committee on Food Security to exercise its functions and investigate the possible existence of a shortage in the government subsidized rice, Representative Heron. To the Committee on Rules. Messages from the Senate, message dated February 12, informing that the Senate invited past Senate Bill 1620. To the Committee on Government Reorganization and the Committee on Public Works and Highways. Message dated February 12, informing that the Senate immediate past Senate Bill number 1662. To the Committee on Rules. Message dated February 13, informing that the Senate on February 12, approved the Conference Committee report on the Bicameral Conference Committee on the disagreeing provisions of Senate Bill 1354 and House Bill 6452. To the Committee on Rules. Communications letter dated January 19, of Roman G. Del Rosario, presiding justice, Court of Tax Appeals. To the Committee on Appropriations. 
Letter dated January 22 of General Ricardo R. Visaya, retired administrator NIA. To the Committee on Agriculture and Food. Letter dated January 24 of Nestor A. Espinilla, Jr., Governor BSP. To the Committee on Banks and Financial Intermediaries. Letter dated January 24 of Eduardo M. Año, Officer in Charge, DILG. To the Committee on Appropriations. Letter dated February 12 of Roger Edino, Deputy Director, BSP. To the Committee on Banks and Financial Intermediaries. Committee reports the part number 607 and 608 on House Bill number 7179 and 7180. To the Committee on Rules. Report number 609, House Bill number 7184. To the Committee on Rules. Report number 610, House Bill number 7185. To the Committee on Rules. Report number 611 and 612 on House Resolutions 120 and 1688. To the Committee on Rules. Report number 613 and House Bill number 7191. To the Committee on Rules. Report number 614 and House Bill number 7193. To the Committee on Rules. Majority Leader. Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, may we acknowledge the guests of... Sorry. Mr. Speaker. What is the pleasure of the Honorable Lagman? I rise on a question of personal and collective privilege. I have reserved this last Wednesday consequent to the speech of the distinguished Deputy Speaker, Garcia. Majority Leader. Mr. Speaker, respectfully move for the recognition of the Honorable Ed Selagman for his personal, for his privileged speech. So move, Mr. Speaker. The Honorable Lagman is recognized for 10 minutes. Mr. Presiding Officer and distinguished colleagues, Deputy Speaker Gwendolyn Garcia, in a privileged speech last Valentine's Day, scored repeatedly this representation for being critical of the position of Speaker Pantaleon Alvarez of not enforcing her dismissal as ordered by the Ombudsman on the grounds that, one, he is going to determine the validity of the Ombudsman decision, and two, only the House of Representatives can dis discipline or dismiss its members. Since Deputy Speaker Garcia refused to be interpolated, I reserve my right last Wednesday to deliver today a rebuttal in the nature of a personal and collective privilege. The speech of Deputy Speaker Garcia gives me the opportunity to further expound on my position against the common stance of Speaker Alvarez and Deputy Speaker Garcia. Towards the end of the regular weekly media briefing of the Magnificent Seven Opposition Group last Tuesday, a question sought the reaction of the group to the Speaker's announcement that he would not implement the Ombudsman decision. Dismissing Representative Garcia for grave misconduct with perpetual disqualification for re-employment in the government service. My reaction consisted of two brief points without even mentioning the name of Deputy Speaker Garcia or insisting that she should be removed contrary to what she alleged in her speech. I said, one, under the rules of procedure of the Office of the Ombudsman, its decision is immediately executory even when the respondent has a pending motion for reconsideration or appeal. And two, the Constitution does not exempt members of the Congress and the judiciary from the investigatory jurisdiction of the Ombudsman, even as the power of the House to discipline or expel its members is not exclusive. It is in this context that I ask, what constitution is Speaker Alvarez referring to? To my knowledge, the Sun Star Cebu was the only newspaper which published my comments. I do not know the political or partisan inclination of Sun Star Cebu. 
I have nothing personal against Deputy Speaker Gwen Garcia. What we are discussing are purely legal and ethical questions. Let me now go to the pertinent provisions of the 1987 Constitution. Section 5 of Article 11 created the independent, let me repeat, independent office of the Ombudsman. Foremost among its powers, functions, and duties as provided in Section 13, Paragraph 1 of Article 11 is to investigate on its own or on complaint by any person any act or omission of any public official, employee, office, or agency which act or omission appears to be illegal, unjust, improper, or inefficient. This provision was quoted verbatim by Deputy Speaker Garcia. It must be underscored that the investigatory jurisdiction of the Ombudsman under Section 13, Paragraph 1 of Article 11 does not exclude members of the Congress and the judiciary. This all in this all-encompassing jurisdiction cannot be limited or impaired by an ordinary statute like the Ombudsman Act of 1989. The power to investigate must logically end in either dismissal of the complaint or a finding or culpability of the respondent. In the present issue, the Ombudsman found Representative Gwen Garcia culpable of grave misconduct. A diligent reading of the proceedings of the 1986 Constitutional Com Commission does not show any intention in the part of the commissioners to exempt members of the Congress and the judiciary from the jurisdiction of the office of the Ombudsman. Mr. Presiding Officer, distinguished colleagues, while it is true that Section 16.3 of Article 6 provides that each House may punish its members for disorderly behavior and with the concurrence of two-thirds of all its members suspend or expel a member, such grant of authority is not the exclusive domain of the House to the exclusion of the Supreme Court and the Ombudsman in proper cases. For example, under the expanded judicial power of the Supreme Court under Section 1 of Article 8, a suspended or expelled member of the House can file a petition for certiorari challenging the action of the House on the ground of grave abuse of discretion as an exception to the doctrine of political question. The Ombudsman Act was enacted almost 30 years ago. House Bill Number 13646 which subsequently became the Ombudsman Act of 1989, was approved on second and third readings in one day, June 8, 1989, presumably because it was certified as urgent. This was the same day the House adjourned Senate Day. The said bill had a very brief but aptly relevant explanatory note, which reads, and I quote, Article 11 of the 1987 Constitution creates the independent office of the Ombudsman as the guardian of public accountability and public trust. To ensure the success of the Ombudsman, this bill is proposed. However, the salutary objective of the bill failed to disclose that embodied in the then proposed measure were provisions which could be in conflict with the Constitution. Not even the sponsorship speeches of Representative Isidro Saraga and Representative Raul Rocco highlighted that members of the Congress and the judiciary are excluded from the disciplinary jurisdiction of the Ombudsman. I truly regret that I had allowed my affirmative vote to be recorded. On hindsight, I should have objected on record to some provisions which could be constitutionally infirm. But as a legislator gains experience and his steadfast advocacy hone his outlook, his sharp and critical mind could subsequently comprehend more easily the import and complications of a proposed legislation or an enacted statute. 
I now challenge the constitutionality of at least two provisions of the Ombudsman Act of 1989, namely, one, Section 82, which provides that a deputy of the or the special prosecutor may be removed from office by the president for any of the grounds provided for the removal of the ombudsman after due process. This provision was struck down as unconstitutional by the Supreme Court in Gonzalez versus Office of the President, wherein it was held that subjecting the deputy ombudsman to disciplinary to, to discipline and removal by the president, whose alter egos and officials in the executive department are subject to the Ombudsman Disciplinary Authority, cannot but seriously place at risk the independence of the office of the Ombudsman itself. Number two, another provision in the Ombudsman Act, which must be challenged and struck down as unconstitutional, is Section 21 in so far as it exempts members of the Congress and the judiciary from this disciplinary authority of the Ombudsman. The foregoing provision is constitutionally infirm when it excluded members of the Congress and the judiciary from the disciplinary authority or jurisdiction of the, um, of the Ombudsman for the following reasons. One, under Section 13 of Article 11 of the 1987 Constitution, the investigatory jurisdiction of the Office of the Ombudsman covers all public functionaries and employees without any exception. The constitutional jurisdiction of the Office of the Ombudsman encompasses members of the Congress and the judiciary. The plenary jurisdiction as mandated by the Constitution cannot be diluted by the Ombudsman Law of 1989 as an ordinary statute. Two, Section 21 also constricts the independence of the, of the Ombudsman as it curtails its jurisdiction over members of the Congress and the judiciary. May you remind the Honorable Agman to wind up? Uh, can I have uh, another 10 minutes, Your Honor? Because uh, this will have to be an extensive discussion. Majority Leader. No objection, Your Honor, Mr. Speaker. Please proceed. Section 21 is class legislation. It is an affront to the Equal Protection Clause because it arbitrarily favors members of the Congress and the judiciary who are all genuinely, who all genuinely belong to the general class of public officials and employees who must maintain honesty and integrity in the public service. There is neither rhyme nor reason for members of the Congress and the judiciary to be excluded from the jurisdictional authority of the Office of the Ombudsman. Members of the Congress and the judiciary do not have any unique or peculiar attributes which would make them a class distinct from other public functionaries and employees who are enjoined to uphold public office as a public class. In fact, there is more reason for members of the Congress and the judiciary to be under the jurisdiction of the Ombudsman because members of the Congress wield powers and enjoy privileges which are prone to abuse, and members of the judiciary should be exemplars of the tenet that public office is a public trust. It is a self-serving exclusion which was extended to the members of the judiciary to conceal the congressional wayward intent to singularly shield representatives and senators from the ombudsman's scalpel. At least four current members of the House have submitted with the acquiescence of the House leadership to the jurisdiction of the office of the ombudsman. They voluntarily serve the respective preventive suspensions imposed by the Ombudsman. These four gentlemen, albeit professing their innocence and demurring from the Ombudsman's jurisdiction, had the decency to submit to the jurisdiction of the Ombudsman. 
it must also be it must not also it must not be overlooked that the ombudsman resolved an administrative case against representative Buen Garcia for acts she committed when she was provincial governor. With respect to the jurisdiction of the ombudsman over administrative cases, there is a separate provision under Section 19 of the Ombudsman Act, which is apart from Section 21. Section 19 provides administrative complaints. The ombudsman shall act on all complaints relating but not limited to acts of omission which are contrary to law or regulation, are unreasonable, unfair, oppressive, or discriminatory, and other grounds of similar import. Section 19 does not exclude members of the House from the administrative jurisdiction of the Ombudsman. Section 18 of the Ombudsman Act authorizes the office of the Ombudsman to adopt its rules of procedure. Section 7 of said rules makes the decision of the Ombudsman immediately executory, even pending a motion for reconsideration or appeal by the respondent. The executory nature of the decision of the Ombudsman, despite the pendency of a motion for reconsideration or appeal, has been confirmed by the Supreme Court in a catena of cases. Now let me go to the Anti-Graft and Corrupt Practices Act. The, the Anti-Graft and Corrupt Practices Act covers all public officers and employees, including members of the Congress, without any exception. Under the Act, a public officer includes quote, elected and appointed officials and employees, permanent or temporary, whether in the classified or unclassified or exemption service, receiving compensation, even nominal from the government. An offense in violation of Republic Act 3019 is cognizable by the Office of the Ombudsman for preliminary investigation and filing once warranted of the requisite information before the Sandigan Bayan. A member of the Congress is not exempt from the jurisdiction of the Ombudsman in the Sandigan Bayan with respect to cases involving the violation of the anti graft and Corrupt Practices Act. Verily, in indictments and convictions under the anti graft law, a member of the House cannot argue that he is outside the jurisdiction of the Ombudsman in the, in the Sandigan Bayan. In fact, under the anti graft law, more particular Section 6 thereof, there is a special provision with respect to members of the Congress. Considering that the anti graft and Corrupt Practices Act covers members of the Congress, any conviction for an offense under said act which involves removal from office cannot be defined by an invocation that only the House can remove its members. By parity of reasoning, the adverse effect of the Ombudsman's finding of culpability for grave misconduct against a member of the House for acts committed by the respondent in a previous position of, as provincial governor cannot be defined because such removal is the logical consequence of the accessory penalty of disqualification from holding public office or employment in government service. The fundamental issue is not who shall discipline Representative Gwen Garcia. The transcendental issue is whether she would submit to the decision of the Ombudsman pending motion for reconsideration or appeal, as is the rule of the office of the Ombudsman. The election of a former local executive to the position of member of the House of Representatives is not an inoculation of immunity from the effects of a perpetual dis disqualification from re-employment re in government service as an accessory penalty for grave misconduct. In the current impeachment proceedings against the Chief Justice, the constitutional tenet that public office is a public trust has been repeatedly invoked with the concurrence of Representative Gwen Garcia. 
This beneficent principle is provided for under Section 1 of Article 11, which reads, and I quote, public office is a public trust. Public officers and employees must at all times be accountable to the people, serve them with utmost responsibility, integrity, loyalty, and efficiency, act with patriotism and justice, and lead modest lives, unquote. This is the same constitutional precept which is invoked in the Declaration of Policy in the Ombudsman Act of 1989. And this is the same constitutional admonition which is restated in the Statement of Policy under the anti graft Law. When Representative Gwen Garcia called on the members of the House to stand together for the immunity of representatives from the encroachment of the Ombudsman, is he calling for the exemption of members of the House from the salutary principle that public office is a public trust? The ball is now in the court of Speaker Alvarez. Whether he freezes the ball or throws it out of bounds is his accountability. Thank you, distinguished colleagues. Thank you, presiding officer. Majority Leader, Mr. Speaker, I move that we refer the speech of the Honorable Lagman to the Committee on Rules for its appropriate action. Is there any objection? The chair is done. Same is approved. Mr. Speaker, may you acknowledge the guests of the gallery of the Honorable Sabiniano Escanama and Honorable Anthony M. Bravo. First is Mr. Raymond Branzuela from Katmon Community Multipurpose Cooperative and Romeo Arabis from Katmon Water Services and Sanitation Cooperative. The guests of uh, Representative Kanama and Representative Bravo, please rise. Welcome to the House of Representatives. <laughs> Majority Leader. Mr. Speaker, today being a Monday and pursuant to our rules, I move that we open the privilege hour. Is there any objection? Chair is none, same is approved. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, I now move that the gentleman from my fellow party list, Kabayan, Representative Suryaku Kalalang, be recognized to avail of the privilege hour. So move, Mr. Speaker. Representative Siriaco S. Kalalang of Party List Kabayan is recognized for his privileged speech. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, my esteemed colleagues, guests, mga kababayan, a pleasant good afternoon to all. Today, I take the floor on a matter of personal and a privilege and as a representative of the Filipino people who have long suffered the negative effects of bureaucracy and red tape. Today, meron po akong ipapahayag sa inyo. Ang U.S. Embassy po ay nag-donate ng mga computers sa ating government agencies. Ito po ay ang mga computers sa NSO o Philippine Statistics Office, sa Bureau of Immigration, the National Bureau of Investigation. Nakareceive po sila ng mga bagong computers from the U.S. Embassy. Isang pindot lang po ng computer sa U.S. Embassy, alam na po ang ating civil status and NBI records and travel records. This means meron ng data interconnectivity among these government agencies, but the data center is the U.S. Embassy. Mr. Speaker, pwede po pala tayo magkaroon ng data interconnectivity kung gagawin o gugustuhin natin. Irrefutable as it is, this is the era of scientific advancements and technological innovations. If truth to be told, the unrelenting rise of technology and its resultant benefits have benefited the lives of many Filipinos. As a matter of fact, our government agencies use computers and internet in processing requests and application. Indeed, in this day and age, our government agencies have taken fully advantage of the technological advancements, but not fully. 
Mr. Speaker, I am the newest member of this House as I only took my oath last January 11. I know that this House has introduced numerous and timely bills that are of great use. In point of fact, we already have Republic Act 9485 or the Anti-Red Tape Act of 2007 for simplified procedures that will reduce red tape and expedite transactions in the government. The newest is Senate Bill Number 1311 or the Expanded Red Tape Act of 2017 which seeks to modify, build the gaps, and cure the defects of existing Anti-Red Tape Act of 2007 in improving the current system of business communities transactions with the government, processing everything at your fingertips. All these are made possible through the electronic business one-stop shop, business permit and license system in cities and municipalities nationwide that provide unified application forms as well as comprehensive checklist requirements. Mr. Speaker, each government agency maintains its own databases and information in pursuit of its mandate and exercise of its ministerial and regulatory functions. As a consequence, they require various documents to strengthen and substantiate these databases and information. What's more, all government agencies require original copies of these documents. If we apply for NBI clearance, driver's license, passport, TIN or tax account number, postal ID, SSS number, GSS number, and Pag-ibig ID, we need to present our original birth certificates, marriage license, and two government agencies. There is redundancy and duplicity in government transactions and applications. We can eliminate the burdensome redundancy and duplicity if there is data interconnectivity among the following agencies. Philippine Statistics Agency or Authority or the NSO, the DFA, the NBI, the BIR, the SSS, and the LTO. This data interconnectivity will present, facilitate government transactions and lessen the burden among citizens. Data interconnectivity can also be used in bank loan applications and assessing risk rating, credit risk rating. As I see it, this problem of in our present community's transaction with the government is a vile mockery of the full potential of man in concocting useful measures to ease the lives of the people. That is true technology. Ironic as it is, we still need to go through this slow and inconvenient practices in our government transactions, when in truth, our world is already dominated with great innovative support. Man has already provided solutions to today's problems through technology. This is, it is also man who can provide these conspicuous gaps, provide peaceable and innovative solutions, and maximize the bursting rewards of technological advancements. Today, we already live in the digital age. Time is of the essence. Our citizens demand speed, velocity, and real time in dealings with the government. We cannot waste time. Mr. Speaker, we must have dynamic, progressive, and responsive way of governance. It is time that we have a data interconnectivity among government agencies. Let us streamline government functions and avoid burdening our citizens. Let us have ease in doing business and transactions with the government. If data interconnectivity could lead us to progress. It is time that we pass the Philippine Data Interconnectivity Act. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, for this privilege. Majority Leader. Mr. Speaker, I move that we refer the speech of the Honorable Kalalang to the Committee on Rules for its appropriate action. Is there any objection? Chair is done. Same is approved. Mr. Speaker, Next to avail of the privilege hour is Representative Maximo B. Rodriguez, Jr. of the 2nd District of Cagayan de Oro City. 
the Honorable Representative Maximo B. Rodriguez Jr. of the 2nd District of Cagayan de Oro is uh, now recognized. Thank you, uh, Speaker. My dear colleagues, I rise on the matter of personal and collective privilege. On the matter of the meager share of Mindanao in the national budget. From 2014 to 2017, the average share of Mindanao of the country's annual budget stood at 12.8%. For 2018, sadly, it decreased to 12.5%. For years, Mindanao has always been at the short end of the stick and has, for all, for all intents and purposes, been neglected. This fact is highlighted even more if one compares Mindanao's share to that of Luzon or the National Capital Region, NCR. For 2018, NCR share is 11.3 percent percentage points more than that of Mindanao. And to, to mind, mind you, Speaker, uh, we have 25 million population in Mindanao, while the NCR has about 8 to 12 million only. For 2018, the six regions of Mindanao will have an aggregate allocation of 318.4 billion which constitutes 14.1% of the 2 trillion, 2.2 trillion billion budget for the national government departments. This amount is 42.2 billion higher than current year's allocation for Mindanao. The budgetary increment for Mindanao in 2018 exceeds that of Luzon and Visayas, but pales in comparison to the budget increases of the national capital region and the nationwide allocation. Further, if one looks at population share and the share in the number of poor families in Mindanao compared to its share in the national budget, one can see that there is a budget gap. Based on 2015 statistics, Mindanao has a population share of 23.9% and a 40.4% share in the number of poor families in the Philippines. Despite these figures, Bindanao was previously mentioned, will only get 14.1 share in the 2018 national budget net of special purpose funds and the 10 national government agencies whose allocations are lumped under the national capital region. As for the different national, national government agencies, there have been improvements in some departments, but there are also increases in others. For the Department of Agriculture, their overall, their overall budget increased from 45.9 billion in 2017 to 54.2 billion in 2018. However, the allocation for agriculture in Mindanao decrease while that of Luzon's increases and also that of the NCR, National Capital Region, which will increase by 12.6 billion. Mindanao share is 17 percent points lower than Luzon. It's also 26.4 uh, percent points lower than the capital, National Capital Region. For the Department of Health, their 2018 budget shows that 54.6% has been allocated as nationwide, but only 7.5 billion has been allocated in Mindanao, which is 2.9 billion lower than 2017 allocation. For 2018, Mindanao is only 7% of the Department of Health budget. For the Department of Education, Mindanao will have 137 billion allocation in 2018. This allocation is 50, 50, 25.9 billion higher than 2017. While the share of Mindanao has increased 
the allocation for Luzon remains substantially higher at 2060 billion. For the Department of Agriculture, Department of Public Works and Highways, I mean, Mindanao's 48.8 8 billion allocation for 2018 is 32% higher than 2017. Its 11.8 uh, billion budget increase is higher than Luzon and Visayas, but lower than NCR's 32 billion. However, Mindanao's allocation pales in comparison to the nationwide 2018 allocation amounting to 399 billion. For the Department of Social Welfare and Development, 35.5 billion of its 138 billion is allocated from Mindanao. This amount, gladly, is 14% higher than 2017's, but still lower than Luzon's 2018 allocation. And while speaker, we, and while we in Mindanao are very grateful for the budget increases, obviously, especially the Department of uh, Education, Public Works and Highways, Disability, we are still hoping that the other departments, Mindanao budget will also increase. We would like to remind the Department of Budget and Management of our President's promise to Mindanao that he will give an equal share of the national budget to the island. With the presidents coming from Mindanao, we are op very hopeful, even now, that we in Mindanao will finally receive a just and equal share in the national budget, which will finally help us develop and reach our potential. Thank you very much, Speaker. That's all. Majority Leader. Mr. Speaker, I move that to refer the speech of the Honorable Rodriguez to the Committee on Rules for its appropriate action. Is there any objection? Chair is none. Same is approved. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, next to avail of the privilege hour is the Honorable Isagani Zarate of the party list Bayan Muna. The Honorable Representative Isagani Zarate of the party list Bayan Muna is recognized for his privileged speech. Maraming salamat, uh, Ginoong Speaker. Magandang hapon ho sa lahat. Ginoong Speaker, ako po ay tumayo ngayon upang magtatalumpati para sa mga empleyado o kawani ng gobyerno, particular sa mga miyembro ng mga makabayang union. Ginoong Speaker, hinihimok natin na tunay na maghatid ng makabuluhang serbisyo, uh, serbisyong publiko ang ating mga government employees o ang ating mga kawani. At karugtong nito, nais natin na may tunay silang pag-ibig sa bayan at sa ating mga mamamayan. Ganito natin matitiyak na sila ay hindi lamang mga kawani o empleyado ng gobyerno o ng pamahalaan, ngunit sila rin ay mga tunay na lingkod bayan. Ang mga kawani ng ating pamahalaan ay tulad ng milyong-milyong mga manggagawa ng Pilipinas, ginawang speaker, na nakikibaka para sa regularisasyon at seguridad sa trabaho. Iba-iba ang tawag nito sa sektor ng, uh, uh, sa, ng, ng sa, sa sektor na ito. Uh, tinatawag silang emergency hired, job order or JO, contract of service o memorandum of agreement workers. Pero sa katotohanan ginawang speaker, ang dulo nito, sila ay mga manggagawang kontraktual Kaya nagkapagtataka lamang na sa ating gobyerno na nangangako na pagkatapos natatapusin ito ang kontrakt kontraktualisasyon ay kanlungan mismo ang gobyerno o ang mga ehensya nito ng di patas at mapagsamantalang patakaran. Katunayan, tumatagal ng mga dekada ang pagiging kontraktual ng maraming kawani sa ating pamahalaan. Ginoong speaker, particular sa mga unyong makabayan o progresibo, sa loob ng mga ahensya ng gobyerno, ang pagtuligsa sa korupsyon at sa mga patakaran ng pamahalaan na may epekto sa interes ng ating mga mamamayan at sa ating bayan. Halimbawa na rito ay ang pagiit ng mga manggagawa ng National Housing Authority ng tunay at makamasang serbisyong pabahay para sa mga maralita. Ginoong Speaker, lihitimo at makatarungan ang tindig ng ating mga kawaning nag-uunyon. 
Kaya naman, ating mariing tinutuligsa ang naging sagot at aksyon ng dating general na si Eduardo del Rosario na siya ngayong tumatayong chair ng Board of Directors ng National Housing Authority sa panawagang dialog ng mga opisyal at miyembro ng Union sa nasabing kagawaran. Sa halip na tugunan ang lehitimong kahilingan at kahingian ng mga kawani ng NSA, nilihis nito ang usapin at direkta nitong binansagang front down ng Communist Party of the Philippines ang union ng NSA. Ginoong speaker, mga kapwa kumambabatas, ginagarantiyahan ng ating saligang batas ang kalayaang magbuo ng mga union, asosasyon at iba pang samahan ang ating mga kawani sa pribado man, mga kumpanya o maging sa mga ahensya ng ating pamahalaan. Subalit ang malisyosong paratang na ito sa mga miyembro ng Consolidated Union of Employees of the National Housing Authority or QNHA ay tahasang pagpapahamak sa mga miyembro nito na maging biktima ng pasistang atake ng tiranikong pamahalaan. Ang paratang ni Chairman de Rosario laban sa QNHA na mga prente raw sila ng CPP-NPA ay tahasang mapanganib dahil hindi lamang ito isang paraan ng sci-war na pananakot, posibleng magdulot din ito ng kapahamakan sa mga nasabing kawani, miyembro at opisyal ng nasabing union. Maalala lamang natin, ginoong speaker, na nagbitiw ng nakaririmaring na pahayag si Pangulong Duterte na shoot them in the vagina sa mga babaeng rebelde. Ang mga ganitong pahayag, kasama ng pasistang atake sa mga sibilyan, lalong-lalo na sa mga lumad sa Mindanao, ay nagpapakita lamang ng kakayahan ng pamahalaan at ng sandatahang lakas nito na magpamalas ng walang puknat na karahasan sa ating mamamayan. Namamayagpag ang paglabag sa karapatang pantao mula sa pagbaha ng dugo sa gera laban sa droga hanggang sa militarisasyon, pambobomba at pagpatay na hatid ng Uplan Kapayapaan at Marcelo sa Mindanao. Hindi talaga, ginoong speaker, mapapayapa ang sino mang bansagang kalaban ng Estado kahit paman hindi ito mapatutunayan. Kaya naman sa paratang na ito, ginoong speaker, tila binigyan ng go signal ni Chairman Del Rosario na dahasin ang mga pinuno at miyembro ng Union ng NHA. Sadsad na sa larangang pagkalinga ng karapatang pantao sa Pilipinas. Ibang antas na ang kahihiyan na pati na ang mga government employees ay ganito na rin ang sinasapit mula sa ating pamahalaan. Particular na isyo ng mga kawani ng NSA ang pagbibigay ng tunay at makataong pabahay na may batayang pasilidad, kinakailangan mga serbisyong panlipunan at kabuhayan para matiyak ang makataong kalagayan nila sa mga pabahay ng gobyerno. Ito po ang mandato ng NSA, ginoong speaker, at maging ng buong pamahalaan. Ngunit, ang pagbubuo ng Department of Human Settlements and Urban Development ayon na rin sa Union ng NSA ay maghahatid lamang ng higit pang privatisasyon ng pabahay at mag-aambag sa malala ng kawalan ng lupa ng mga mamamayan sa ating kanayunan. Bukod pa sa isasangkalan nito, ang seguridad sa trabaho ng mga kasulikuyang empleyado ng National Housing Authority at iba pang matitingkad na isyo kaakibat dito. Ito, ginawang speaker, ay mga lehitimong mga alalahanin ng union at ng mga kasapi nito. Muli, tunay naka, nakababagabag na imbis na sagutin ni Chairman Del Rosario ang mga usaping ito, ay nahulog siya sa makartiyism o sa pagpaparatang ng mga, sa mga union bilang mga komunista. Wala bang may isagot si Chairman De Rosario sa lehitimong mga isyong nilalapag ng Union ng NSA? Wala ba siyang katwirang lalampas pa sa red baiting? Dinaig, dinaig na ba siya sa pag-aanalisa ng mga empleyado ng NSA? Kaya ito na lamang ang kanyang naging katugunan. Para saan pa kung gayon ang kanyang pagkakalukluk sa National Housing Authority kung wala itong may isagot sa mga usaping pabahay at iba pa ang mga usaping pambayan Ginoong Speaker, hindi ligtas sa political persecution ang mga hanay ng mga unionista sa loob ng ating pamahalaan at sa iba't ibang ahensya nito. 
Katunayan, ginawang speaker noong December 3, 2012. Dinakip si Randy Vegas at Raul Campusano, parehong mga organisador ng Courage, ang samahan ng mga uh, kawani sa ating pamahalaan. Ito isang federasyon ng Government Employees Union. Sila ay kinulong sa gawagawang kaso at ipiniit sa Camarines Norte at nanatiling nakapiit hanggang sa kasalukuyan. Hindi rin bago ang ganitong masamang gawi ng pwersa ng, ng, pwersa ng Estado sa mga kawani ng pamahalaan. Kung ating maalaala ginawang speaker noong 2015, kinundina mismo ng Presidente ng Integrated Bar of the Philippines na si Attorney Rose Reyes ang pangharas at in intimidasyon ng mga membro ng Courage. Aniya, the Integrated Bar of the Philippines strongly condemns the harassment and intimidation perpetrated by elements of the military and the police against members of the progressive sectors of our society, particularly political activists and advocates. The high-handed exercise of authority is a throwback to martial law and has no place in our democracy. Ayon pa kay Attorney Reyes. Kaya bilang panghuli, Ginoong Speaker, mga kapwa kong mga babatas, hinihimbok ko kayong manindigan para sa karapatan ng ating mamamayan sa karapatang mag-unyon ng ating mga kawani sa pamahalaan at para sa mga empleyadong nakikita ninyo sa inyong paligid ngayon. Bilang mga kapwa na sa serbisyo publiko o serbisyong bayan, maninindigan tayo para sa ating mga government employees at sa ating mga mamamayan. Maraming salamat, Ginoong Speaker. Majority Leader, Mr. Speaker, respectfully move that we refer the speech of Representative Senagani Sarate to the Committee on Rules for its appropriate action. Is there any objection? Chair is none. Same is approved. Mr. Speaker, respectfully move that we recognize Representative Emily de Jesus of the party list Gabriela for her privileged speech. The Honorable Representative Emily de Jesus of the party list Gabriela is hereby recognized. Maraming salamat, Mr. Speaker, at magandang hapon sa lahat ng ating pinatawan na narinito ngayon. Ito po ay may kaugnayan doon sa isang napakalaking issue, kaugnay sa isang sektor na patuloy na naghihirap. Nais i-rehistro ng representasyong ito, ang pagkaalarma, at hindi sasapat yata ang salitang pagkadismaya, kundi pagka pagkundina sa isinasagawang operasyon tanggal bulok, tanggal uso na kontra umano sa mga luma at smoke belching na jeepneys. Mula Enero, mahigit isang libong tsuper na ang sinita, pinagmulta o di kaya ikinumpis ka ang lisensya dahil umano sa paglabag ng minamanehong jeep sa mga isinasaad na standards. Mahigit isang libong kabuhayan at pamilya na ang walang pakundangang binulabog ng Interagency Council for Traffic or I act para isulong ang crackdown sa mga jeep. At libo-libong pasahero na rin ang naapektuhan ng isinasagawang operasyon. Isang konkretong halimbawa nito, Mr. Speaker, noong February 8, nagkakagulo po sa UP Diliman dahil ang mga mag-aaral ay walang masakyan dahil sa ginawa nilang operasyon. At kahit sa ang lugar, Uh, siguro naman, lahat ng mga kahit tayo ay nasa mga pribadong sasakyan natin kapag tayo ay umuwi. Makikita natin kapuna-puna ang mga kawawang computers na wala namang ibang inaasahang sasakyan, kundi mga jeepney na pagkahaba-haba ng pila. Higit na nakakagalit kung sisilipin ang guidelines na ginagamit para matukoy ang hindi compliant umano sa jeep. Bawal daw pumasada ang may, ang tawag po nila, may pansit na wiring. Bawal daw yung higit sa isa ang kulay ng ilaw sa loob ng jeep. Bawal din kapag may bakbak ng pintura ng jeep. Kada violation, limang libong piso agad ang multa. Napakalaki nito. Sa katunayan, higit na mas malaki sa karaniwang boundary ng isang chopper sa isang araw. Sa dami at haba ng listahan ng mga bawal, talagang hindi na talaga ah, papasada ang mga chuper. Tsak, masisilip na paglabag na naman ng LTFRB sa halos lahat ng jeep. Para sa representasyong ito, Mr. Speaker, ang intensyon ng gobyerno sa pagsasagawa ng kampanya 
ay unti-unting walisin ang mga jeep sa kalsada para bigyang daan ang mga umanoy modernong jeep at alinsunod sa programang modernization ang tingin namin sa aktwal ito ay tuluyang pag-face out sa mga jeepney pagparalisa sa kabuhayan ng mga chofer ang isinasagawang crackdown maliit na nga ang kanilang kita at bugbog na bugbog na sa pagsirit ng presyo ng produktong petrolyo at iba pang bilihin bunga ng train Ginagatasan pa sila ngayon ng rehimen upang gamitin ang mga multa. Sa napakatagal na panahon, walang natanggap na suporta mula sa gobyerno ang mga driver ng jeep. Masahol pa. Kung natatandaan nyo, inalupwasta pa sila ni Pangulong Duterte noong nakaraang taon nang sinabi niyang magdusa ang mga mahihirap na chofer. At para takutin ang mga chofer na lumaban sa programang PUV Modernization, kung natatandaan natin, sinampahan pa ng kaso ang kanilang leader, ang leader ng Piston na si George San Mateo, bilang bahagi na ng atake sa mamamayan. Kung usok at usok din lang ang pag-uusapan, nagsisilbing smokescreen itong tanggal bulok, tanggal usok para sa jeepney face out. At ang nakakabahala, ang magiging ganap na korporatisasyon ng pampublikong transportasyon. Pabor ito sa mga malalaking negosyante na karamihan ay bahagi ng oligarkiya, magbebenta ng mga bagong unit ng jeep, at magbabaon sa utang sa mga operator at chofer. Sa isang hearing, inamin mismo ng Department of Transportation, Nasa darating na April, nasa 500 na bagong jeep ang papasada sa kamay nila at ilang probinsya. Kasunod nito, inamin din nila na bunga nito itatanggalan ng prangkisa ang mga lumang jeep para igawad sa mga bagong unit. Nakakabahala, dahil kung bulok din lang ang pag-uusapan, hindi ba nagmimistulang bulok ang isang programang wala namang masusing batayan maliban sa agresibong tulak ng pribadong kapital? Sa committee hearing hinggil sa PUV modernization noong nakarang Nobyembre, inamin mismo ng LTFRB na hindi pa tapos ang pag-aaral kaugnay ng programa, maging ang Route Rationalization Plan. At sa mismong hearing na yun, ang representasyon ito ay nagbanggit na, nakaka na puro drawing ang mga opisyal ng gobyerno kung hindi naman nila masasagot ang mga susing tanong. Magkano ang itataas ng pamasahe? Ano ang magiging disenyo at daloy ng ruta? Paano maa-absorb ang mga driver na mawawala ng kabuhayan? Na ngayon pa lang po, napakarami ng chofer ang talagang lumalapit sa iba't ibang opisina para humingi ng tulong na animoy mga pulubi samantalang able-bodied naman sila at handa naman talaga silang sumagupa at magserbisyo sa ating mamamayan. Mga kapwa kinatawan, Mr. Speaker, hindi biro ang isasagawang pag-face out sa mga jeepneys dahil apektado ang mahigit na 600,000 chofer tatlong daang libong operator sa buong bansa at tandaan nyo, kabilang ang kanilang pamilya. At kung mananaig ang malalaking negosyante sa public transport, tiyak, magtataas ng minimum na pasahe para siyempre bawiin ang kapital. Tatama ito sa bawat pamilya, lalo na sa pamilya ng mga manggagawa at maralitang Araw-araw, sumasakay ng jeep. Tama ito sa mga kababaihan, lalo na sa mga ina na pilit pinagkakasya ang kakarampot na kita sa harap ng hambalos ng taas presyo ng halos lahat ng bilihin. Kaya naman, mahigpit na kaisa ang Gabriela Women's Party ng mga chofer para pigilan ang planong PUV modernization o pag-face out sa kanila at malabanan ang isinasagawang crackdown na uh, ngayon ay tinawag na operasyon tanggal usok, tanggal bulok. Nagbibigay po kayo din kami 
sa mga chofer at iba pang sektor na kumikilos para sa laban sa jeepney phase out na incidentally ngayong araw ay meron silang ginawa para itala ang kanilang paninindigan. Malinaw na bagamat modernization ang bansag sa programa, hindi naman ito ang titiya pagdating sa kanilang kabuhayan at kagalingan ng kanilang pamilya. Hindi katanggap-tanggap na ang mga nagtutulak ng programa ay baka mas concerned pa doon sa mga tinatawag na wiring, iba-ibang kulay ng jeep, kaysa doon sa kabuhayan ng mga chofer at ng mga manggagawa na nakikinabang sa serbisyong ibinibigay ng jeep. Sa pagbabandila ng ganitong programa at pagturing sa mga ordinaryong mamamayan, tsak, tuloy-tuloy, nauusok ang galit ng sambayanan at titindig laban sa ganitong programa sa bangis ng kapital at siyempre doon sa mga dikta ng gobyernong ito. Mr. Speaker, kapwa ko mambabatas, sana po maunawaan natin ang kalagayan ngayon ng mga chofer na mawawala ng hanap buhay. At bakit hindi asikasuhin kapag sinabi nating modernization at pampublikong uh, serbisyo ang ating nasa isip. Higit na dapat bigyang pansin ang pagtitiyak ng pagsasaayos ng LRT. Higit na bigyang pansin ang pagsasaayos ng pampubliko at pangmasang transportasyon. Muli, ang paninindigan ng representasyong ito ay ang paglaban at pagkukundina uh, sa operasyon na tanggal usok, tanggal bulok. Magandang hapon po. Majority Leader, Mr. Speaker, respectfully move that we refer the speech of Representative Emmy D. Jesus to the Committee on Rules for its appropriate action. Is there any objection? The chair is none. Same is approved. Majority Mr. Leader. Mr. Speaker, respectfully move that we recognize Representative Sarah Jane Ilag of the Party List Kabataan to avail of the privilege hour. So move, the, Mr. Speaker. The Honorable Representative Sarah Jane Ilago of the Party List Kabataan is hereby recognized. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Our fellow representatives, colleagues, and to the Filipino youth and the people. This afternoon, I rise on a matter of personal and collective privilege. On Youthquake 2.0, and why the youth need to stand for rights, freedom, and democracy. Human rights violations are now, though not supposedly a norm, with killings happening every day, reports of threats and harassments happening even more often. Attacks on the rights of the youth are no different and are now even more blatant and devious. The passage of the Universal Access to Quality Tertiary Education Act is a victory of the youth movement for free education, though ironic that the youth would have to fight for a right that they should have been granted in the first place. Its implementation, however, betrays that hard-earned and well-deserved victory. As university and college administrations are now forced to find ways to circumvent the free tuition policy and the new law because of the limited capacity that we have in our public universities and colleges. The K-12 program, Mr. Speaker, which promised jobs for graduates of senior high school students, has brought additional two years of heavier financial burden to families. This year, the program's first batch of graduates will be forced to find jobs in companies and industries that find them to be, in a recent statement, not work ready. Companies and industries who are now lobbying for more internship hours from all these senior high school students. If genuine education is our goal, Mr. Speaker, then holistic development 
instead of mere job readiness, should be the primary factor of any reform in the education system. These challenges to youth's right to education cannot be fully realized in a system where even education itself has to bow down to the interest of profit of capitalists and investors. And when the youth do admonish the system, however logically and rationally, they are threatened not only by their university or college administration or officials, but also by the heads of government themselves. The admonition, needless to say, comes from fear of dissent, a view that the young people have no role in society other than to sit inside their classrooms, memorize dates, places, events, and repeat alphabet letters or theories or solve equations from books. It is a view that we most despise for hindering our development as well-rounded individuals. It is a view that seeks to isolate the students and the youth from being aware of our societal ills and the plight of the marginalized and oppressed. Instead of reprimanding the students and the youth, let us ask why they dared to join these solidarity actions and demonstrations. We must guide them instead of threatening them of being kicked out of their universities and colleges where they would have undoubtedly learned more from the masses and beyond the four corners of their classrooms. When the youth join these mobilizations, we do not do so as a hobby or leisure, never as a form of escape, never as an excuse to cut classes or never to attend classes, and never as a form of arrogance. When the youth join these mobilizations, it is because we have finally realized that many of the democratic rights and services we enjoy today are victories won through the collective pursuit of the people. When the young people join protests, it is because we have finally realized that our individual concerns are not too divorced from the oppressive system that perpetrates structural ills in our society. It is because we have realized that we are not at all immune from the effects of bogus reforms, of anti-people policies, of anti-drug and counterinsurgency operations. It is because we have realized that we are deprived of our right to education for the very same reason that other sectors are deprived of access to other basic social services. This is because of the preference to outsource these services in favor of profit, and which in turn milk, making us milking cows at the expense of the people's rights and welfare. For the youth or the young people joining these mobilizations, demonstrations, solidarity actions, we must show our support and solidarity. Let us be proud of them, for they have chosen to become leaders, not only of tomorrow. They have chosen to become leaders of today. When the young people join these mobilizations, they relieve the spirit of the first quarter storm. They aim not only to be like those who were once young, they aim to draw inspiration and lessons from these who fought before us for them to be braver and stronger. Coincidentally, Mr. Speaker, Oxford Dictionary's Word of the Year for 2017 
was Youthquake. Youthquake is defined as a significant cultural, political, or social change arising from the actions or influence of young people. In the Philippines, 2017 was only a year for the people to gain traction for its campaigns for full-blown nationwide and massive demonstrations. On February 23, the youth and student sector will conduct a nationwide action, an expression of a resolute commitment to fight for right, freedom, and democracy. For with the worsening human rights, economic and political situation of the country, it would be a sin for the youth to remain silent and in effect to side with the oppressor. 10 or 20 years from now, the youth will wake up to the same horrific conditions if they do not rise up to fight against the oppressive system that persists up to this day. And it is better to fight with all strength and vigor rather than to regret not doing so. Likewise, we strongly encourage all legislators to stand in solidarity with the ranks of the marginalized and oppressed. Yung mga walang boses sa ating lipunan ang ating bigyan ng boses. Let us give them a moment of our times out of our chairs, out of our offices, and unite with them in their fight for genuine social reform and democracy. Para sa mga kabataang Pilipino, para sa mga iskolar ng bayan, let us take a moment out of our classrooms, bring your readings and your books in the demonstrations if you must. Let us show the administration, our leaders, our policymakers, that protest and learning in the classroom are not mutually exclusive, but should complement each other. Hindi lang nalilimitahan sa apat na sulok ng ating mga classroom ang ating pag-aaral, lalong-lalo na kung ito ay para sa pag-alam kung paano ba natin gagamitin ang lahat ng ating mga natututunan na mga teorya, na mga mahalagang punto sa ating kasaysayan para naman magsilbi sa ating bayan at para hindi lamang mag-aral ng kasaysayan, kundi tayo na mismo ang gagawa ng kasaysayan. Nagkaroon na ng mga panalo noon ang mga nauna sa atin sa mga konseho na mag-aaral, sa mga pampublikasyon ng mga alyansa, sa iba't ibang mga grupo na nakabatay man sa mga eskwelahan o sa mga komunidad. Ngayon naman ang panahon upang tayo ang magpanalo ng mga laban para sa susunod na henerasyon. We vow to march and to stand beside the interests of the marginalized and oppressed, Youthquake 2.0 on February 23 is not only about the youth and student sector or their issues, concerns, and challenges confronting their sector, but also about the struggle, more so about the struggle of the Filipino people and how the youth have actively participated and will continue to actively participate in it. Isang makabayan at palaban na hapon po sa lahat. Maraming salamat, Mr. Speaker. Magkita-kita po tayo sa darating na biyernes, February 23, kung saan magkakaroon ng boses para sa pagkakaisa, para sa karapatan, sa kalayaan, at sa demokrasya na hindi po natin papayagan na maagaw mula sa ating henerasyon at sa mga susunod pa na henerasyon ng mga Pilipino. Maraming salamat muli, Mr. Speaker. Majority Leader, Mr. Speaker, I move that we refer the speech of the Honorable Sarah Jane Ilagot to the Committee on Rules for its appropriate action. Is there an objection? Chair is done, same is approved. Mr. Speaker, I move that we terminate the privilege hour. Is there any objection? Chair is done. The same is approved. Mr. Speaker, I move that we now proceed to the consideration of measures under the calendar of business. 
Yes, sir. Only business, business for the day. Please proceed. Under the calendar of business, Mr. Speaker, I move that we consider House Bill Number 7134 as contained in the Committee Report Number 599, submitted by the Committee on Health. Mr. Speaker, copies of the bill have been previously distributed to the members. I now request, therefore, that the Secretary General to read only the title of the bill without prejudice to insertion to the records of the text thereof. So move, Mr. Speaker. Any objection? The Chair hears none. The Secretary General is directed to read the title of House Bill 7134 and call the roll. Please proceed, Secretary General. House Bill Number 7134, an act providing policies and prescribing procedures on surveillance and response to notifiable diseases, epidemics, and health events of public health concern, appropriating funds therefore, repealing for the purpose Act Number 3573, otherwise known as the Law on Reporting of Communic Communicable Diseases. Mr. Speaker, I move that the chairperson of the Committee on Health, the Honorable Angelina Tan, be recognized to begin her sponsorship of the measure. The Honorable the Representative Angelina Tan is recognized. Mr. Mr. Speaker, please consider the explanatory note of my House Bill 3163 as part of my sponsorship speech. Mr. Speaker, I respectfully move that the explanatory note as state, stated in the measure be the sponsorship speech of the sponsor. So move, Mr. Speaker. Is there any objection? The chair hears none. The same is approved. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, respectfully, you know, move to open the sponsorship speech and debate. The period of sponsorship is now terminated. I respectfully move for the period of interpolation, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, there being no other, no member who wishes to interpolate, I move that we terminate the period. We close the period of sponsorship and debate. Is there any objection? Chair is none. The period of interpolation is now terminated and closed. Mr. Speaker, I now move that we open the period of amendments. Any objection? Chair is none. The same is approved. Mr. Speaker, there being, there being no committee amendments nor individual amendments, I move that we close the period of the amendments. Is there any objection? The chair is none. The same is approved. Mr. Speaker, I now move that we vote on second reading House Bill number 7134. So move, Mr. Speaker. All those in favor of House Bill number 7134, please say aye. Aye. All those against, please say nay. The ayes have it. House Bill 7134 is now approved on second reading. Mr. Speaker, I move that we spend the session for a few minutes. Session suspended. Majority Leader. Mr. Speaker, there being no matters for the day, I move that we adjourn session until tomorrow, February 20, 2018, at 4 o'clock in the afternoon. So move, Is there any Mr. objection? Same is approved. Session is adjourned until February 20, at 4 o'clock in the afternoon.